Blasphemous 2 is one of the easiest games I've played this year. With overpowered defensive items and the same 10 copy and pasted with occasional recolors enemies, there isn't much of a challenge presented to the player. That's not to say this game is unfun or bad. The fact is though, challenge is one of the most important aspects of a game to me, and honestly it's important to this genre, and Blasphemous 2 just failed to deliver that for most of the game. But then, in the final stages of the game, and standing right smack dab in the middle of my path to an ending, was Daddy. Sporting a great duel-like fight and one of the most banger soundtracks in this god-tier OST, Daddy was the first boss that not only presented a challenge, but kicked my ass for more time than I'm willing to admit. But to explain how and why this boss destroyed me so utterly and psychologically, we need to set the stage that by the time we reach this fight, you have the necessary context to accept my unbiased version of the story. And so I can make myself look better so, a quick recap of Blasphemous 1, the main game boss fights are pretty mid. Except, of course, the sprite and artwork, which is just amazing, but the DLC really turned my opinion of the game around. Adding both some amazing New Game Plus exclusive boss battles, as well as a final DLC that set up the events of the second game, with even more good boss fights. The only important thing that you need to know for this fight is that they decided to kill off the only interesting character with actual lore in the first game, leaving Blasphemous 2 feeling very empty in that department. However, with the extra content added in Blasphemous 1, I really thought that the Game Kitchen had figured out good boss design, and was hotly anticipating the sequel. Well, here it is, and the boss design and movesets are actually pretty good, and like I said, the OST is god tier. The problem is that just by using the base game mechanics like defensive items and exploration, you trivialize almost every boss fight. I'm not going to go over every single one, just the ones that pertain to Baddy Daddy, but rest assured that whatever I say about these guys applies to the rest of the bosses of the game probably more so. So first up we have Orospina, Lady Embroiderer. This boss, while easy, is just a really great concept. The music is just this ever increasing tempo beat that matches the dancer fencer fighting style of this boss. And unlike the other bosses I'm going to talk about, she does have a bit of a story tied to the area she has found, and actually has a reason for even being there. And because she's one of the early bosses, I can't criticize the difficulty too much. Like I said, it's a fun fight and concept, and I honestly wouldn't even have a problem with the level of challenge if there were more than a grand total of 11 boss fights in the game. But with such a low number, it hurts when there are boss fights past the tutorial that feel like a letdown, and Blasphemous 2 is full of them. But anyways, Orospina has a pretty simple moveset, with thrust dashes similar to Hornet from Hollow Knight, and a move similar to Lady Butterfly in Sekiro where she balances on a thread midair while shooting projectiles. And she progressively gets faster over the course of the fight, matching the tempo. However, her health pool is very small, so the fight ends when it really gets going, but overall it is well designed and fun. Moving on, we have Les Mess and the Sleeping Infant. This is a dual boss that actually hits a level of challenge that most of the other bosses don't, partly because this is a three-stage boss fight. To start the fight, we have Les Mess, who is a flamethrower holding a coffin for reasons. While the occasional slam attack is seen, mostly this guy is laying out pillars of fire, slowly while you whack away until his health is gone. Much like any elemental attack in the game, you can just stack fire resistance to trivialize the damage this guy does. I don't really like this design, as using the resistances shouldn't make the fight forgettable. It should just be what you have to do to survive. At this point, the coffin or tabernacle thingy drops to the ground and we get to be edgy and attack a child. This baby's moveset would be pretty decent if you couldn't just take away 80% of its health bar before it even starts fighting. After absolutely stomping on this child, the real fight starts against both of them. You can choose who to focus on first, seems I chose rightly, and my trusty sword's moveset seemed perfectly designed to handle the big boy. It's folded, tempered, and it does its job. For me, this was a signal that the rest of the game would start to be more challenging. You know, like how a normal difficulty curve works. Nope. Say hello to Benedicta of Endless Orison. Now say goodbye. Turns out she is weak to fire, and most players will probably have the triple fireball still equipped at this point. It doesn't matter if you don't, because she also has no health to speak of. Again, the concept of the fight is really cool, using the teleporters from the preceding level to avoid her attacks and position yourself for maximum damage. Unfortunately, this fight is just over before it even begins. And then we get Odin of the Confraternity of Salt. With a name like that, you would assume he would be after the player's tears. On top of having next to zero lore behind this character or even why he's at the fort, the boss feels like an early game tutorial fight, with extremely slow Dark Souls melee attacks and summoning ads that you have already fought a million times in the preceding level. This guy might be the most forgettable boss in the game. 
I'm not joking, I actually forgot this guy existed until I checked the boss list. But he is important for the narrative of this video, so here we go. So I reached this point and was not expecting much. Maybe just a reskin to Prasanta duel, and in a way it's sort of like that. We start off with Dracula from Castlevania, sorry, Eviterno, daddy of the penitents, floating and shooting projectiles while summoning pillars of fire. You know, blasphemous boss dot text. He does have a cool move where he summons a massive sun looking fireball, but this move is basically time for big damage. But it's endgame, and this guy was hyped up, right? There is gonna be a second phase. He picked up Crisanta's sword, called it, and then, holy sh <laughs> If Eterno actually does damage, like when he hits, he hurts. He has a good amount of health to actually allow the boss's moveset to play out, and because I had steamrolled the entire game to this point, my body was not ready for the sheer amount of shame I would feel, as Eviterno bodied me over and over. Here's a boss that actually asks you to respect it, to learn its moveset. And the moveset is actually awesome. So we have his basic combo. It's a slow, heavily damaging three-hit combo. If you parry the first hit, he only follows up with one more attack, which is also parryable. The twist to this is that it comes out really fast, and because Eviterno can teleport, this means you have no idea which direction the second strike is going to come from. Your parry frames do activate instantly, so it feels fair once you figure out the timing of the second strike. However, if you mess up the parry on either of these strikes, the third one comes out. This attack is meant to bait you into trying to dodge away and then come back with an air dash. The trick on this move is to just ground dodge into the attack so you can get some hits while the energy wave does absolutely nothing on either side. If at any point in this fight you decide to get some distance from Daddy, he has a couple options to deal with that. The first is a lightning fast energy wave that might be parryable, but I never pulled it off. This one always seems to assure that when I healed, I would lose half of that heal right away. The other move is this awesome Gale-esque flip slam attack on loan from Berserk. And this moment was the key to the fight for me. Learning the tell and then either sliding under or jumping over at the correct moment gives a large window to stack damage with either Triple Fireball or the Mystical Saw Blade. Or if you're feeling like a true penitent Chad, the large beam of holy damage. At half health, Eviterno gains this massive screen clearing slash, which at first felt almost unfair until I remembered you have a duck. You have just enough time to slide dash into a crouch when this attack comes out. It really feels like one of those perfectly tuned Sekiro boss movesets. God, I wish we got more of this in Blasphemous 2, it's so good. At about a third of his health left, we get this badass energy pillar attack, which then launches us into a black screen where all of the important preceding bosses we already talked about showed up to do their special moves in a row. Basically a survival gauntlet. This probably would have felt cooler if these bosses mattered at all, but it's a good moment either way. Not too difficult, but that's not the point. It's basically a moment to give players some breathing room from the sheer intensity of this battle. Oh yeah, did I mention the absolute banger of a song going on during this fight? The soundtrack in this game better win some awards. From this point on, Eviterno's attacks have a little extra sauce added. Waves of flame after slams, large fields of damage, and slightly faster intensity. This is one of those bosses where I reached the finish line multiple times, only to choke at the last second and just laugh at myself. Fortunately, I don't really have anger management issues, so breaking controllers never crosses my mind. Generally, it's just a sigh into sad realization that I just experienced major skill issue. Finally though, after more than an hour of attempts and almost setting down the controller for the day, I got the dream run. A perfect zero damage first phase, followed by one of those epic moments we all love where I just knew father's moveset perfectly. This boss was so much better than the fights that came before, and disappointingly, way more challenging and memorable than the final boss of the game. To be fair, endgame bosses that are weak is a great concept, from Software has used this time and time again to get that moment of pathos, which is generally awesome. But this final boss isn't built like that. It has a complex moveset. It's just kind of boring and again, elemental defense makes it trivial. For a sequel, this was a bit of a disappointing ending to the game, but if I'm being perfectly honest, Blasphemous 2 is mostly a general improvement over the first game, and we can hopefully expect as much post-launch support to Blasphemous 2 as we got for the first one adding many more bosses and game modes and an overall higher level of challenge. 
Anyways, pick up Blasphemous 2 if you are feeling that Metroidvania itch, I recommend it, and as always, thanks for watching the video, and see you guys soon for the next one.